Yes. Splendid. Can everybody see the screen? Splendid. So, um, Donna, you've done the recording declaration, haven't you? Yes, we've just spoken about that. Excellent. Okie dokie. Right, welcome to my presentation on supporting people with autistic spectrum conditions, uh, pre and post bereavement. Um, and we'll do a quick run through of uh, what an autistic spectrum condition actually is as well. Um, I'll apologise in advance. Um, I'll try to avoid generalising and pigeonholing, but it is a very short and very sort of general, broad introduction. Um, uh, when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. If you support somebody with autism and have been doing for the last 20 years, you know about this more than I do. Okay, it's just a sort of bit of a disclaimer. I don't want you to go away and do something that I've said to do that you think is a bad idea. So, we will rattle through a quick summary of what an autistic spectrum condition is and how it may affect the pre and post bereavement experience. Um, ordinarily, I'd like to take quite a lot of time over this, but I will be very brief. So um, if you want to hang around at the end and ask questions, I, I will make myself available. So going back to the 1800s, uh, the chap in the black coat is somebody called Jean-Marc Gaspard Etard. He was a Belgian physician and he found somebody uh, who's pictured in the bottom left called Victor of Aveyron. Now, Victor was uh, a feral child uh, who lived in a forest in Belgium. And was widely agreed to have been the first actual agree, uh, sort of uh, discovery of somebody with an autistic spectrum disorder. So he noticed incessant movement, rocking back and forth, the grinding of teeth and sudden and sporadic movement, all of which is sort of consistent with some people that you may support. Now, latterly in 1943, this is Leo Connor. He did uh, some research in South Dakota, uh, the three girls and eight boys. Um, again, uh, widely agreed to have been an early on discovery of, of people with autistic spectrum conditions. His key identifications were an obsessive insistence um, on, on routine and persistent sameness and a powerful desire to be alone as well. Okay. Um, Hans Asperger, who was writing around about the same time, uh, you've no doubt heard of the term Asperger's syndrome. So um, he identified much higher function in children, but he saw a direct and callous form of communication, obsessive areas of interest, the ability to talk incessantly uh, without response and difficulty understanding social cues. Those are consistent with most people with high functioning Asperger, high functioning autism or Asperger's that you might discover, difficulty understanding social cues particularly. More latterly, uh, this is Lorna Wing. Lorna Wing had a daughter who had an autistic spectrum condition who died, I believe, in the early 2000s, as did Lorna Wing herself. Now, Lorna Wing, um, very much the giant upon whose shoulders people like Simon Baron Cohen stand now. Her ideas have been developed and they are far more nuanced than what she had originally written. But for the purposes of a sort of broad, broad conversation like this, this is what I'm going to use. So social communication, social interaction, social imagination, those are the three key areas that people with autistic spectrum conditions generally find difficulty. And also the sensory integration process, right? Which is registration, orientation, interpretation, organization, and execution. Now, as complicated as that sounds, it really isn't. If you think about it in terms of, for example, you've got yourself a hot bath, right? and you put your toe in your hot bath and it's far too hot and then you go out and then you remove your toe. That's your registration, orientation, interpret, organization and execution of senses, okay? So what you'll do is you'll go, ah, ha, 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 like that. And then you won't like conceptually think something to yourself. You think, hmm, I've put my toe in the hot water before. What did I do last time? I took my toe out. Ah, yes, that worked very well. And then I stopped being in pain, didn't I? Conceptually, that's what you think, but you don't think it in that kind of format. That's the sort of thing that people with autistic spectrum conditions could find much more challenging than we could. It's called an executive functioning. I'll come back to it in greater detail later on. Senses as well, vestibular, which is your balance, taste, touch, auditory and visual, all difficulties for people with a lot, a lot of people with autism. So, all of these add up as a combination to challenge something that's called flexibility of thinking, which is a fairly self-explanatory term because we've got two types of memory. We've got rote memory and we've got semantic pragmatic memory, right? Now, people will hear 
um, all sorts of stories about people with high functioning autism and so on. So oh, it was amazing. Uh, he could ride on a he couldn't ride on a bus on his own, but he was able to recite pi to two hundred and fifty thousand digits or something like that. Or he could tell you who all the ki kings and queens of England were in order. Or he was brilliant at maths, but he couldn't do something social like riding on a bus. Another very straightforward um, response to that explanation for that is down to flexibility of thinking. Right, because pi, I don't know if there's any mathematicians out there, but pi is 3.14159, da, 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 and it goes on for ages. Right, that's not subject to change, that will never be subject to change. That is what it is, it's in its right place. In the same way that one plus one equals two, um, in the same way that um, uh, oranges are the colour orange when they're ripe, etc. These things are facts. These things, if you've got a rote, good rote memory, you can remember these things because they're not going to change. Semantic pragmatic memory deals with the more emotional stuff and it deals with something primarily called your flexibility of thinking. Now, for example, let's just say there was no lockdown and we were having a training session on a Friday afternoon at the hospice, right? And June came in and said, look, I know you're supposed to be training today, but I've decided I'm all going to give you all a hundred pounds just to go shopping or to the pub or something. Now, neurotypical people will go, yes, thank you very much. I'll deal with that just perfectly. <laughs> That's fine because I have the flexibility of thinking to deal with something like that. I have the ability because flexibility of thinking is ultimately the ability to react to events. Okay. So, Yes, he could recite pi absolutely perfectly over 50,000 digits, but riding on a bus he struggled with because it could go a different route. You could have a different driver. You might have a different amount of change that you had last time. You might go a different route. You might not be able to sit in the same seat. All of these things require flexibility of thinking, oh, well, that's happened, so I can do that instead. And what more could happen to you to challenge your flexibility of thinking than to have somebody die within your family? And that's why the importance is of a presentation like this is so high because it can be a real challenge. So to summarize what the great minds of people who've written about autism say, they like people like structure, uh, reliance on a persistent sameness, have difficulty sometimes interacting, have difficulty interpreting social cues and a desire to be alone, all of which are exasperated at challenging times such as pre or post bereavement. So that's a very, very, very brief whistle stop tour of what an autistic spectrum condition actually is. So what do we do to support? So the very fact that autism kind of uh, um, affects people the way it does. So in terms of memory, in terms of sensory issues, in terms of like the social issues about how we need support in the community sometimes and things like that, right? All leads to a highlighting for people to have the need to control control and predict their environment. If you've ever supported somebody with an autistic spectrum condition, you'll find that controlling and predicting your environment is really, really important. Even if it's just, you know, move that there, move that there, light switch needs to be there, that needs to be switched on, okay? Knowing what's going on, knowing what's gonna happen. So we find things like schedules are really, really important. Social stories become really, really important because all of those things, a person with autism, invariably because of their disorder, but invariably because if you have care, you have less control over your life than anybody else. So if you key in the social factors and the, sort of the neurological factors, all of those three being able to control and predict the environment, knowing what's going on and knowing what's going to happen, exasperated, really, really important. Am I going at an okay pace? Is everybody keeping up okay? Cool, thank you. Um, and, and we only need to ask ourselves some questions because it, invariably we're going to be asked questions if when we're in a sort of pre-bereavement period, i.e. Um, we have somebody who has a life-limiting illness who we're expecting to die. Can we hide details and protect the person from them? Well, if we're carers, if we're parents, if we're family members, if we're a loved one, then we're kind of hardwired to, um, to protect, you know, if, the, the, the horrible man walking down the street who's shouting, you know, I, I protect my child from that. Um, the, the dog that's barking and running that doesn't have an owner, I can protect my child from that. Can we protect the child? Can we protect our children from this? No, we can't. Um, because it's definitely going to happen. And that seems to be the kind of thing that we need to take into consideration. Does the knowledge actually exist? This is important. There have been a number of people with uh, autistic spectrum conditions that I've supported and we've gone through 
the stages of illness yes um granny for example granny's got this illness this illness will affect this part of her body she needs this part of her body because it does this and then that will probably be the thing that granny dies of and okay fine when's this going to happen then ah well here's the issue because we don't actually know um, so it's important that we communicate, not just that we, we don't know, but that knowledge doesn't actually exist. We don't know when this is going to happen. It can be really, really important. And for those who don't know, um, what to expect when visiting a hospice can be a really, really anxious time as well. My contact details will be at the end of the, um, uh, at the, end of the presentation. If anybody needs more guidance with that, just get in touch. So one of the essentials is consistency of message. It's better to have an average message promoted consistently than some good and some bad. So, for example, uh, myself and a colleague run the Waterbugs group, right, which is a group for children of family members uh, who are unwell. OK. Now, one of the prerequisite parts of the group is that the child knows that that family member is unwell. If we were speaking to a family member and they said, oh, yeah, we haven't actually told him yet what's going on that can be hugely problematic. So we need to make sure that teachers, family members, and people who are supporting are all giving the same message to our person with autism, because there's that need for consistency. It's better to deliver the same message consistently than a variety, even if that message isn't one that we necessarily agree with. Um, another fact is that 65% uh, of people with autistic spectrum conditions also have coexisting psychological, psychiatrical, cognitive issues such as anxiety, Tourette's, dyspraxia, or obsessive compulsive disorder, learning disability, epilepsy, or ADHD. Now, it's, uh, there's been a lot of research done into this, but what is absolutely true is that any disability somebody has associated with any of these is likely to be more severe at times of anxiety, and if those anxieties are brought in either pre- or post-bereavement. So if somebody with um, uh, Tourette's has a difficulty verbally communicating, it's likely to be worse when they're anxious. Um, if somebody has dyspraxia um, at a time of anxiety they will find their fine and gross motor skills are, are, are more affected than they would be at a time of calm so what can we do to support well with somebody with autism we don't say things we don't mean uh, saying anything we don't literally mean so for example you're taking the mickey you're eating humble pie three sheets to the wind bite the bullet etc 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 we need to know and understand if we're supporting somebody with an autistic spectrum condition that they are very, very likely to take us literally. And when I say literally, I mean very literally. So we avoid cliches, we avoid, uh, avoid exaggeration, we, avoid, uh, we um, avoid any kind of communication which can't be written down, taken out of context, okay? This is a sentence that um, I heard said, and it led to possibly the biggest uh, emotional meltdown that I'd ever seen in somebody I was supporting. Um, because his sister said, mum says, if you're good, she might take us on holiday somewhere nice soon. And uh, this was a huge source of, um, of anxiety for him. And when I look at it, it doesn't really surprise me. Um, if you're good, good, what does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. Um, I, I, I co-parent my, uh, my daughter's mum, what, what she thinks is good behaviour and what I think is good behaviour, very, very different things, very, very subjective term. She might, so there's uncertainty, take us on holiday somewhere somewhere's uncertain nice nice is subjective soon soon doesn't mean anything so immediately in there you've got an absolute handful of uncertainty in one sentence a sentence that was supposed to be an incentive for good behavior was actually a catalyst for a serious meltdown because of the sheer lack of uncertainty and subjectivity in the sentence i sincerely hope that makes sense so when asked for example how long the person with illness is expected to live be specific but ensure the person knows you're not withholding an answer but that there isn't an answer so um how do we support post bereavement to include funeral planning um regarding our language we use words like has died or is dead because with the most effective support, not necessarily just for people with autistic spectrum conditions, but also anybody with sort of uh, cognitive difficulties and most children as well. It's about making the implicit explicit. So we don't shy away from using explicit language to remove any doubt of what has happened. An explicit message can be delivered compassionately. So, uh, for example, saying, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, granddad had a heart disease and the doctors tried very hard 
uh, to help him, but they couldn't get his heart started again, so he's died. Okay, that's a very compassionate message, but it's also a very, very explicit one. And what we've done is we've avoided using words like passed away, gone to a better place, gone to sleep, lost. If you lose something, you can find it again. Uh, people who go to sleep can wake up. Somebody who's gone to a better place could come back again, passed away again. Very, very subjective phrase. Okay. So difficulties with autism exasperated pre and post bereavement. High level of anxiety due to structure. So what works effectively? Structure does. People with autistic spectrum conditions depend very, very heavily on structure. Remember what I said earlier about people with Asperger's present as very callous sometimes, i.e. they speak in a way, they very much shoot from the hip. No great understanding of the social and cultural norms that we are so proud of in Britain, right? So for example, um, the non-autistic world seems to make much less sense the more you know about the autistic world because we spend an awful lot of time saying things we don't mean and doing things that we don't really have a reason for. So in the way that, for example, a child asks you why you do something and you kind of go, why do you say that? And you go, I don't know, we just say it. If you're in a position where you go, I don't know why we say that, we just say it, then you can vouchsafe that the person with autism will struggle with it. So structure, hugely important. In fact, I was listening to a very good podcast. I think it's by a lady. She put it on YouTube and uh, she said she found out that her dad had died when she was on her way to a music festival. She has very high functioning autism. But she said her immediate reaction was just to go ahead with the plan. Going ahead with the plan, keep into structure. You'd be absolutely blown away by the sheer volume of children who go to school the day after a family member dies because it's that reliance on structure. It's that reliance on what I know. Something that I don't understand and I'm conceptually really struggling with happens. So what do I go to? I go to the norm. I go to the norm because the norm is a place of comfort. It's somewhere I can control and predict what's happening. And I have an understanding of where I am and where I'm at. It's consistent. I know where I am. I know the shapes. I know the smells. I know who everybody is. So I'm going to stick to the schedule. Um, so unexpected reaction, what is the person's perception of the death? Oftentimes, everybody struggles with the perception of death and their understanding of what it is for a number of reasons. People with autistic spectrum disorders more likely to sort of find it quite differently. So the, like I say, the immediate reaction is to carry on with the plan. And why wouldn't you do that? You know, there's an awful lot of occasions where you find out about a death and people in, so for example, uh, in, in, in my team, we do day after death meetings with family members and people say, I haven't really grieved about it yet. I haven't really dealt with it yet. I haven't had a cry yet because you don't have those reactions straight away. Now, all the sensory issues that somebody with an autistic spectrum condition lives with all leads to slower and more sluggish processing of senses, of discomfort, of emotion, of smells, of taste, of all of those things. And it's no different in, the, in, um, in times of bereavement. You find something out, you don't have that reaction to it straight away. It might take an extra day, it might take an extra week, it might take a year, it might never happen at all. So slow processes, reliance on the structure, and that may sound callous. Some people find it really difficult that somebody's just found out about a death and they just kind of go on with their ordinary day. Um, but for an awful lot of people with autistic spectrum conditions, that's the way forward. I need to stick to what I know. It may take time processing the information. That's the executive function that I told you about. But what we might find as well is something called shutdowns. And this is where our executive functioning is important. Because you might find eating, washing, showering, cooking, all the things that we do as a norm, if it involves a process, somebody with autism is going to find it more challenging. So to you or me, you just go, oh, I'm, I'm going to have a shower. Um, but I'm not just going to have a shower. I'm going to go upstairs. I'm going to turn the shower on. I'm going to undress. I'm going to find a towel. I'm going to work out what I'm wearing afterwards. I'm going to suss out what I'm going to clean myself with. So suddenly that's not one activity, it's six activities. And it's something if you're neurotypical, you take for granted. It's something if you've got autism that you don't. Because that's why those schedules are so important, because you don't get those wrong, because the executive functioning is affected because of the senses. Making sense? 
So I can only see about five faces, just nod. Um, so responses. Remember, we know sensory processing can be delayed in the same way reactions can be varied and delayed. Bereavement takes time to digest and process. That's not the same for just people with autism, that's the same for everybody. And of course, for those who know, people with autistic spectrum conditions often laugh at inappropriate times. This can be uncomfortable. It can be challenging, it can be difficult, people may um, not understand it. I have been at a position where I was supporting somebody in a funeral of a family member and he said something disgustingly inappropriate. Um, it was uh, one of the uh, uh, more category A swear words, let's call it a uh, noodle for now, and uh, he crossed the threshold of the church and said very loudly, I don't know why we're all here, nobody liked that noodle anyway. Um, because that was what was on his mind, and that's what he thought, and that's what he said. So possible reactions to death. What we might find is that um, cognitively, somebody with an autistic spectrum condition um, might need to see a body. And that's not necessarily out of anything um, morbid or, or any kind of fascination with seeing it. It's just the understanding, um, because, there's an awful lot of start, middle and ending when you're supporting effectively with people with autism. Um, so to see a body might actually be that reality check that actually, no, I, I can agree with this now, I can move on with this now because conceptually I can say to you, somebody's died um, and you know it's true. If you have, uh, for example, an absence of flexibility of thinking, the ability to just then say, oh, okay, that person's died, okay, we'll react to that you might actually have to have that visual aid of seeing somebody's body to actually have an understanding that that person's life has ended because you might not have a conceptual understanding of the death or what the death is. Um, and we don't make promises we can't keep for reasons of consistency. Um, something to consider as well, um, people with autism very often um, can have meltdowns, can have periods of, of uh, emotional stimulus where, um, they get very, very anxious, very, very angry, perhaps stop listening to what's being said. And there is a condition, alexithmia, which is difficulty understanding and describing emotions, anger, jealousy, etc. may seem difficult to identify the difference between them uh, or support in, in what we would call a meltdown. Okay. Now that seems fairly straightforward, but in reality, that's something that, that I think anybody would struggle with. So for example, let's just say, um, for the time being that I got a text message off my wife and she told me that she didn't want to be married anymore. She wanted to be with our milkman. Okay. Just for sake of argument, it's not real right now. I'd be angry. I'd be quite envious. I'd be quite jealous. I'd feel quite betrayed. Um, I'd feel concerned, you know, who's going to live in my house with me. I'd be immediately reviewing the sources of my dairy products. That's like six emotions immediately. Okay. Now, if you roll all those together, it's easy for me to sit now and, and, and sort of concoct a, non, uh, a non-existent uh, social situation for myself and say, yes, I think I'd probably feel like this. And I think they'd probably feel like that. When you're feeling those feelings, it's a very, very different thing. So what a meltdown is, is when you've got a whole bunch of feelings in one big, sticky, angry ball and it's chucked at you and you can't talk your way through it. Um, so not be able to communicate need of support motion. What can we do? We do um, lots of things in the family support team. We've got these um, sets of cards. They're a good sort of, um, they're a good way of sort of motion. I did actually have them with me. I've moved them. I apologize for that. These uh, little emotions boxes. That's a really nice way to, um, to actually sort of move forward. If somebody's prior to a meltdown, if they've got some anxiety, they're not quite happy to discuss some visual, visual aids like that. Anything like that can be really important, can be really useful as well. We've had some really positive feedback in the family support team from some people who supported with autism. Um, and strength, this is kind of an aside. It's okay to show grief in front of children, the perception of strength. I hear an awful lot of people, particularly when we're supporting teenagers, who say things like be strong. And be strong basically means don't cry in front of me. And um, I have a big task telling an awful lot of teenagers that strong people cry and strong people show emotion. 
And it's the same for people with autism. And don't try and repress feelings in yourself or others either. It's really, really important that people know that it's okay to cry and it's okay to communicate what's going on. So it needs to be proved. We might like to see a body. We don't make promises we can't keep. We stop it from coming out of the blue. Accessing pre-bereavement support, communication. Um, uh, our details will be uh, on the screen at the end. A further advantage of using bereavement support is it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Pre-bereavement support can also mean the person associates somebody other than a family member with the situation. But at least two occasions where I've had really good relationships with families and they've said, thank you very much. You know, we've appreciated your support with the best all in the world. We never want to speak to you again. Um, because we can be that buffer between the person and the family and the death. Um, so somebody would associate us with the death and not the family member that told them. And that can make life an awful lot easier because we are kind of seen conceptually um, as, as that we're seen conceptually associated with the death. He's the person who works at the hospice and then after support is completed, they can put us away uh, and not see us again. And then we've done our bit. Um, so a quick bit about funerals. Um, I'm just going to check the time. Oh, blimey. I'll rattle, I promise you. So funerals difficult because they're social. People with autism really struggle sometimes with social. How to react, how to behave, how to dress, important to prepare. Will there be food? Will there be drink? What do I wear? Um, so what I would normally do is this is something I made them. Uh, I've done a few of these uh, for people prior to funerals. I did this one about the Simpsons because obviously I couldn't use a real family for um, reasons of confidentiality. But the way it's communicated, there's nothing in there we don't mean. It's very, very straightforward. On Wednesday at 10 o'clock, we're going to grandpa's funeral. You will go with mum and dad. The funeral will be at the church. Sometimes people will cry. That kind of word in, very, very straightforward, nothing we don't mean, nothing complicated about it. So the advantages of social stories are they offer reassurance, clarity, structure, consistent management of expectations. If you're supporting somebody who incessantly questions, will ask you the same questions over and over and over again. That can be a really challenging 12 hour shift. If somebody has an effectively drawn up social story, all you need to do is refer them back to it. It's not going to change. You don't need any flexibility of thinking when you're doing something like that. It offers reassurance, clarity, structure. I know where I am. I know what I'm doing. I know what's happening next. And I know when it's ending and I get to go home and go back to my usual business. So um, reactions and consideration. So you could tell somebody's going to be buried. People saying, this can be really challenging. People say nice or less balanced things about a person, emphasizing the strength and downplaying the weakness. So if you're somebody who lacks flexibility of thinking and the person who died is maybe slightly somebody difficult and then you go to a funeral and they go, well, they didn't suffer fools gladly, did they? Or something like that. You know, when they sort of say really nice things about people when they maybe didn't like them that much after all. It's having that explanation that socially, this is what we do. We might actually sort of highlight the person's strengths and we'll talk about the weaknesses maybe away from the funeral and why we do it. Again, social cultural norms. If we can't explain why we do something, we can pretty much vouch say that the person with autism isn't going to understand. People with autism may talk directly and factually. This can be challenging. I could talk to you all day about that, but I won't. Um, uh, we need to explain what death is, uh, that somebody's no longer in pain, that they're no longer unwell, and depending on the individual, something that smells of them, something worn by them, a recording of them, anything like that, we can use those things as good memories as well. Um, conversations we can have about times and places, what's appropriate and inappropriate behaviour. Again, flexibility of thinking. There are things that you can do at home that you can't do in the community. There are ways of speaking that's appropriate to speak to a family member that isn't appropriate in the workplace, isn't appropriate when you meet the queen, isn't appropriate when you're speaking to your grandmother, etc. If it requires some flexibility of thinking. So we make the implicit explicit. Everything we say is something we mean and we avoid any kind of colloquialisms or exaggeration. Um, because otherwise it feels like the world isn't safe. The, the, uh, the rules keep changing. Neurotypical people can't be trusted. These are the sort of things that people might feel if you keep changing the rules and if we don't use that flexibility of thinking. It's very, very easy to get wrong, but it's all manageable as well. Um, and sometimes it just helps to support by having a bit of empathy. How do I feel in a situation I don't understand? Um, if you think of people with an autistic spectrum condition as somebody with just a different culture, you're actually dancing around the solution of how somebody can be supported effectively. 
because if we were to, I mean, there, there, there are countries in many parts of the world, if we all just went in a magical time machine now, um, we would easily offend somebody, probably me. Um, and we would say things that were out of order and we would behave in a way that was considered rude by the locals. And I think that's a really useful way of actually supporting somebody. So summary, we need a world that's easy to control and predict. We make the implicit explicit. Uh, we watch our use of language. We understand that our experience may differ from the person we're supporting. We understand that concepts may require visual confirmation. Our message is consistent. And most importantly, if you need help, get in touch. Those are our contact details to make referrals to the family support team. And that, my dear colleagues, is 30 minutes on how to support people with autistic <laughs> spectrum conditions pre and post bereavement. Fabulous. Oh, thank you, Andy. You're uh, welcome. So oh, that's great. Um, we, we've had a question, actually. So um, I, I don't know. Um, shall I unmute you there, uh, Donella, and then you could ask it yourself? Okay. Oh, sorry, Ed. We're having muting wars now. That's it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just wondering now because of the predictability and certainly the proof of proof of death. Um, if you've had any instances where you've supported um, anyone with autism, because now obviously with COVID nineteen, you can't often see the body or indeed um, the person before they passed away. So how is that impacted on um, autistic people you've supported? The whole COVID thing um, has been, I would imagine, quite catastrophic. I mean, if you look in terms of, I mean, a lot, a lot of the places where, where I've worked previously, um, routines, are, like, like I say, are absolutely king. You'd have somebody who would, who would become very anxious, for example, if you couldn't get the chippy on a Friday night, or if, if we were traveling from Worcester to Upton, but we had to go via Malvern instead of Hanley Swan and things like that. That's the kind of level of things. So this has affected routines across the board. Um, I would, if I was in that situation, I would say probably use of effective social stories. I would say we did actually put out um, something for a, a social story about COVID virus, about how at the moment, because of the way COVID virus affects people, we can't support you one to one. We can only support you in person and things like that. Um, so, to, I would say to answer your question, yeah, I mean, not being able to see bodies and things like that's been catastrophic for all sorts of uh, for, for all sorts of people. Um, what I would do would probably be use of Pex and Makaton. I'd maybe come up with some sort of social story, both with what's going on, but also an understanding of why you can't go and see that body at the moment. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a huge catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I noticed then when we were saying we put something out. Hannah, you were nodding. Was if I now meet you and you can add to that first. Um, yes, we did put out something on um I think it's on our website and on social media, um, which I can uh make available or share again on our website for you to see. Brilliant, thank you. But yeah, I mean, if there, if anybody's got any sort of specific issues that they need something making up, I mean, the widget software is paid for, and and you know, we can come up with things like that in a very short amount of time. Can Can I ask if there's anybody else that's sort of attending today, if if they've had to um, support this in their roles um, in any way recently? I know we've got a mixture of roles in the in the in the room, virtual room, but didn't know. So has anybody got any uh, general questions or, or thoughts um, for Andy? Oh, Colette, let me unmute you. I can see you. Oh, muting wars again. Shall I do it? That's it. That's it. Thank okay. you. Yeah, I, I was just wondering because I, I don't do uh, work with children or young people particularly but I guess within the hospice it, it, do you have a, a good sort of assessment system for picking up people because I, I think it's quite sensitive finding people at that pre bereavement stage within a family to know when to, to get in and start that intervention. Yeah that uh, uh, yes is, is the answer I mean in terms in terms of the assessment process <clears throat> What's really, really important in an assessment process is um, if somebody has an issue it, and they have 
autism or they have a learning disability or they have a mental health issue or something like that it's always in the assessment process it's about well, what works for that person okay mm -hmm. so if you say for example this person has um i don't know a little bell and they ring a the little bell and they calm down it doesn't necessarily matter what the diagnosis is we kind of um focus less on the diagnosis and focus more on the social aspects i.e what works for that person so there have been times where i mean i've i've particularly supported people who i've thought that person probably has an autistic spectrum condition they might have asperger's they might have a learning disability something like that there's nothing statemented yeah. however what we can work on is a strategy that works for that individual so either way it can be useful to have a diagnosis but if there isn't one it's not the end of the world in terms of early intervention yeah i mean th that person's family is generally the expert in that in that person and the more on side they are the easier it is to support them um but yeah yeah it's it's it, it is it is hugely challenging but as long as the family are on side and they can let us know what works for that individual it's it's usually manageable mm. Does that answer your question? I can't yeah, remember. No, that's question. good. Thank you. Yeah. No, Thank that's you. a good point about not having the diagnosis, isn't it? You know, that, that's great. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I certainly remember, this is going back a few years now, I supported a lady who, um, I think she had, I think she had like, I, I believe the word used at the time was psychotic. Mm -hmm. And there was autism and severe learning disability. And I remember a chap saying to me, I, I can't work out why she's doing that. Is it because of her psychosis? Is it because of her autism? Is it because of her learning disability? And go, well, if you park the diagnosis and look at the person, just work out what works for that person. It doesn't really matter what the diagnosis is. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, you know, if it works for that individual, then it works for that individual. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I have a question, Andy. So um, can you almost do sort of, sort of CBT work? You were saying about sort of ring a little bell to calm somebody down. So yeah. Can you do that kind of work where you can find those sort of systems and things that would work? Yeah, I mean, I, I had um, the most effective one I had was with a young lad and they said, um, I, I made him a stop sign because um, it was just a, and just that, just a, a laminated stop sign. You got anxious. If you hold if, and, and, and we did a social story, said if you hold up your stop sign and he won't ask any questions, he will stand up, he will leave the room and the session will be over. To be fair, he only used it the once out of about 12 sessions. And he did. He just held it up. And it's, um, yeah, again, it's, 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 just that, it's, it's just that strategy, that way of communication. In terms of CBT, no, I wouldn't because I'm not qualified to do that. Yeah. Um, I noticed Hannah's kindly um, put up the, uh, the information of these stories. So the social story created by... That Hannah. was so quick. I know. She's so busy. She? She's amazing. So if you go into the chat facility and, and click there um, you can download that. Um, I mean, I don't know if um, people, as we're sort of sitting talking, want to, if they want to put uh, their email addresses in, it's for contacts of, you know, I mean, Andy's mentioned a few sort of resources um, uh, and obviously people haven't signed up today as such. We haven't had a list of who's joining us. So if you wanted to put your emails um, in the chat facility, then I, we can capture them um, at the end. Um, if, if people would like sort of any information that Andy can send, um, then, uh, then do that. Or if alternatively, if people are sort of struggling to find the Jack chat box, because I know that can happen. If you have a pen and paper, um, my email address is um, uh, djones at saintrichards.org.uk. Um, just in case, and then you could just sort of ping me, or me an email and say, could I have some follow-up information? So, okay, just so I get that out of there. Um, so in, any more questions, Brandy? Oh, may I make a comment? Okay, let me just, yes, please. You're unmuted, um, we've got LBB. Um, so I don't know if when you speak, if we'd be able to hear you. We, no, we're not. We're not hearing anything from LBB. Would you be able to write your comment in the chat box for us? Oh, connecting to audio. Audio. Woo 
Okay. I'm just not sure if they're able to. We're getting lots of email addresses, which is brilliant. We will collect those. I'll copy and paste all them. Oh, I was going to do it for you, Andy. You can Oh, no, 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 you can. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. LBB's connecting again. Oh. <laughs> I'm not sure. I can't. I can't see that they're achieving it. Bless them. I don't know if it might be easier to write in the chat box. I'm intrigued by LBB. Okay. Whilst we're waiting to see how LBB can uh, can connect, is there anybody else who has any comments or questions? We're getting lots of thank yous, Andy, which is brilliant. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming out. I appreciate you all. And Sally, I will send you a copy of the presentation. Not a problem. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, um, I thought it was really good, considering the short amount of time you had to fill, up, um, fill us with all that information. Thank you. Um, in my... In my previous life, I worked as a school nurse in special uh, special needs schools. Oh, so really? With, yeah, I dealt with quite a few. Well, we had a lot of kids with on the autistic spectrum. Um, and so obviously there were issues that occurred at school. Um, we found, like you say, that the most important thing was the consistency of, of message. Absolutely. So communicating with the parents and the teachers to make sure everybody was saying the same thing was incredibly um, important. Um, oh, thank you. Do, you. do you communicate with the children's schools as well? Presumably? Yeah, yeah, we've had um, yeah, we've had input with um, with a number of, of the local schools. Yeah, mm, yeah, we, we yeah, we. I mean, we have a lot of information. Um, re referrals have come through the school as well. Oh, we have LBB said I was just going to say that Andy is totally right with the need to keep things factual and also have evidence. LBB, thank you. You mysterious and very intelligent person. <laughs> 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 and I love oh, these, are really, these are lovely comments thank you all I really like your description of the meltdown and the emotions I, th I think that you um, really got that over really really clearly um, oh, thank you and simply to help us to understand what's going on in that other person's head because it is quite difficult you have to really um, spend some time with people I think to each individual to understand what makes them work you know <laughs> would you know um, yeah. i was very, i was i was very privileged to have um have been trained by some very very good people um and i i often think that the, the training i had kind of it gave me the ability to empathize but it also gave me a level of understanding that made me think do you know what this really isn't complicated no um, you, and i think when you think something isn't complicated it's quite easy to explain to other people yeah yeah Okay, we have another comment from um, our mysterious LBB. It says, um, I have two children with ASD who had to see their father before they would accept he passed away. Uh, sorry, it's Louise B. It oh, hello, Louise. Oh, we still can't hear her, but she's putting her chats in, so that's good. Thank you for coming, Louise. I'll speak to you soon. Oh, so gosh, that's... Yeah, she says, hi, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I mean, do we have any, um, anybody else who has, um, has had these experiences? Obviously, Sally was saying about her past experiences. So, anybody else want to share anything like that with the group before we finish up? Oh, we've got Sarah, if I unmute you. Okay. We're, we're having we're having muting wars, Donna again. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, just to say, my daughter's sister-in-law is severely autistic, and she's um, a young lady in her early twenties. And they—it's exactly what you're saying, Andy. She everything they do, everything they say, it has to be really carefully thought out. If they've said it, then it has to happen. If it doesn't happen in the way that they've described it, then all hell breaks loose. And um, she's lived in residential care for a number of years now, since she was 18. 
Um, and COVID has absolutely floored her and completely floored yeah. the whole family. None of them have been ill, none of them have got it, it's all fine, but she just does not understand where they are, um, why she's only speaking to them like we're speaking now, why they're not visiting. It's just heartbreaking. Um, so Jean, Jean, sorry, Jean, um, Jean-Marc Gaspard Itard in the, um, in the opening slide, uh, he used the expression, changes of routine drive him to despair. And when you think about that, I mean, when you think about the routines that it's driven us to despair, yeah. we're neurotypical. You know, yeah. and when you when you consider that, when you think, right, you know, your your routine is king, and you don't have the flexibility to think about what's going on. I mean, then then you see how catastrophic COVID could be, yeah. and, um, and invariably is. And in, I mean, I, I my heart goes out to a number of people that I've worked with over the years. It must be not just to them, but the people supporting them. It, it must be absolutely just just yeah. incredible what's going on. Yeah, Alice is grieving, um, but nobody's died. You know, it's yeah. just really hard. So I thought yeah. I'd share that one. Uh, thank you. And, and that's conceptual grieving as well, isn't it? That's not, that's not even grieving an individual. That's grieving a, a, a thing. Yeah. Which can be as challenging. Mm, thank, thank you, Sarah. Um, Pam had a question as well. We'll have to make this our last question, um, Andy. Unfortunately, our schedules with our bookings of these Zooms is very tight and we have another one scheduled after. So I'll unmute you, Pam. Hi. Oh, okay, can you hear me? Oh, hi, Pam. Hello, Andy. Hi. It's um, that that was a really good presentation, Andy. And um, I've worked with one client, um, a young girl who's about eleven years old, and um, she's on the autistic spectrum, and so is her father. Interestingly, and it was a grandparent who had died, and I think it's just wanted to make the point that how it impacts on the rest of the family because they don't realize that that autistic child is actually um grieving because they don't show it in the same way um, absolutely yeah and she she clearly w was and she was saying you know inappropriate things at times the family the, the mum was worried that she wasn't grieving and yet was married to someone who is autistic as well and so it, I think it's just really important to engage the whole family, um, you know, when you're supporting that child, as we do anyway, when they're young. But, um, but yeah, she, she was grieving in her own way for her, her grandmother, um, but just couldn't show it, not in the ways that we might expect. I think that's the, that's the real challenge of it, because, I mean, it's like I say, we do we're absolutely pickled in social and cultural norms and, and things that we've got to do and got to say and we don't have objective and practical explanations for why we do it and it's really really difficult for people with autism because you go no we do that why do we do that I don't know why we do that we just do yeah. you know and, and you kind of think to yourself if I spend enough time thinking to myself why I do things and the only explanation I can come up with is I just do then I can vouchsafe that my friend with autism will also have that same struggle yeah I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that this little girl was missing her, her grandmother hugely. And it hadn't been an easy relationship in the family anyway. But, um, yeah, I, I hope hopefully she's still benefiting from our care. But just your presentation was great because it just sort of filled in some of the background for me because I'm not anywhere near as experienced as you are, particularly in that field as well. So it was great to hear all of that. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. And thank you all for coming out. I really, really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. And as I said, I've, I've gathered all the email addresses that everybody's put on. So Andy will send slides and information out to you all. So thank you all for joining today. Um, and you never know, we might be able to um, twist his arm to do something more in the future. So Absolutely. No problem. Thank Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.